stop eating when you feel full, create a minimum 12 hour fast window, don't eat things that aren't food, eat every three to four hours, breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, don't graze, try to avoid eating over 20 grams of added sugar in your food, drink minimally, have like no more than six drinks a week. And when you choose alcohol, go with the wine, go with a dark beer or a dark alcohol that doesn't have a bunch of sugar in it. If you adhere to that common sense, you're going to succeed. You're going to be just fine. But it's when we overeat and we eat garbage that things just go completely sideways for us health wise. Hey everyone. Now we say all the time that the best exercise is the one that you'll actually do. No one knows this better than personal trainer Jillian Michaels, who many of you probably know from NBC's hit show, The Biggest Loser. Jillian is also an eight time New York Times bestselling author. And in today's show, she shares everything she's learned since being on The Biggest Loser, including her best nutrition and exercise tips. We also talk about why the wellness community can feel so combative at times, especially between those with different points of view. We wholeheartedly believe that well-being should be a conversation, not a lecture. And I encourage you to listen to this one with an open mind. Jillian, welcome. Thank you for having me. So great to have you, my fellow Miami (laughs) resident. Uh, (laughs) For as long as we can have you, we'll 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 keep we'll keep you here in Miami. So, you know, look, you're you're an icon in the fitness space, and it's been quite some time since you left The Biggest Loser, and you're also older. You're wiser, definitely older. Older and wiser, and I'm curious. Well, I can hope on wiser, but definitely, I'm definitely older. I, I have managed to accomplish that. I appreciate the humility. Um, so, ha- has anything changed or evolved in terms of your philosophy since loser, uh, or since your 20s, or still the same? What's changed? What hasn't? Well. When it comes to loser, I'll be honest with you, nothing has changed with regard to the work that I did with those contestants and the reason that I did that work. So you have to understand that these are individuals on a life or death intervention on a ticking clock, that at any given week, they can just go home. That's not real life. That was the um, the environment that we were all put in. Those were the parameters that were set for us. And certain things need to happen under that pretense. Obviously, there needs to be an education about food and fitness. But outside of that, they need to have a rock bottom moment where it becomes more painful living the way they've been living than the fear and the work associated with change. They need to take responsibility for where they currently are, despite the fact that they are arguably in the position they are in because they were victimized at one point of their life or another. But if you perpetuate that cycle, right, you're fundamentally disempowered to change. So while you can approach it with empathy, which is like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I'm so sorry you've gone through this. I know this is hard. The conversation also becomes, but you are continuing to do this to yourself now, because if you don't give them the tools and get them to take responsibility, they are disempowered to realize changes within their grasp, right? Because if you're a victim, you have no control. And then the third part of it is they needed something significant, a significant success that cracks this prison they've created with regard to who they think they are and what they think they're capable of and what they think they're worth. So you can tell somebody, love yourself and you can do it and come on now. And it becomes like that skit in SNL back in the day. I think it was Jack Handy, right? I mean, it's it's bullshit. It's not going to work. How do you redefine somebody's self-image by giving them a reality they've experienced that they can believe in? So now they go from, oh, I was the kid that was never picked in PE. Oh, I was the quote, funny fat guy in the family to the guy that just ran the mile, the guy that just did the 5K, the guy that just did the push up on his hands and feet, or the girl that just did her first pull up and slowly you open up this infinity of possibility where they're like, oh my God, I had no idea I could do this. What else is possible? So 
what I was doing on that show is so far beyond what people claim they know about it. I've seen so many people in the media talk about, oh, they're eating 500 calories a day. Bullshit. Oh, they're doing this, that, the other. Bullshit. Like they have no idea what they were eating. They have no idea how they were training and they have no idea the work I was doing with them. Did I enjoy the show's format? It's common knowledge I had issues with the show's format. Nobody should be eliminated. You know, it, like, I, I would never have established temptations. Oh, I was never a producer on the show. I think the show needed a mental health expert. There were a lot of things I would have changed on the show, which is why I was on and off the show because I never had the power to change it. Um, but my philosophy with regard to what I did with those contestants has not changed an iota. My growth and evolution in health and wellness has been dramatic just because from you know 17 years old to 48 years old, of course I'm constantly learning and constantly growing. And my personal uh, priorities have shifted and changed. You know, in my 20s, I just wanted a flat stomach. Now in my 40s, I want to be a role model for my kids. I want to meet my great grandkids. I want to live to 100 disease free. Obviously, you know, you're, you're, it's not even necessarily that your priorities shift, but they add layers of depth <laughs> as you proceed throughout the decades. So, you know, not only has my wealth of knowledge changed with regard to longevity practices and the quality of my food, because if you'd read my very first book when I was 30, you would have found recipes that had artificial sweeteners in them until I learned. And that was probably the biggest correction of my entire career, to be honest with you, is I actually came out and apologized for those books. And I wrote a book called Mastering Your Metabolism. And that changed the game for me with regard to food quality. And I've never, I've never reversed a position on pretty much anything I've said since then. Uh, but so that you know, to try to answer your question in a very long roundabout kind of way, my priorities have evolved and my knowledge has expanded. So there have been changes according to that. So a lot to unpack there. I'm curious, but, but, but a fantastic starting place. It's better to have a lot to unpack than nothing to unpack. Uh, so how would you describe your nutritional philosophy today? In the way that I would educate another human being looking to be healthier, I would use common sense. I would keep it as simple and accessible as possible. So I would tell them, don't overeat, right? Stop eating when you feel full. Mind you, I'm talking about an individual that does not have an overeating problem, an addiction to food, because that's a, that's a completely separate conversation where I think intuitive eating will absolutely fail. Uh, but we'll, we'll table that. I think it's great for the person that has 10, 15, 20, 25 pounds to lose. It's like, okay, when you're done, you know you're done, right? Listen to your body. Create a minimum of a 12-hour fast window, which has existed throughout history. It's called breakfast, breaking the fast, right? If you want to get crazy, you can go to 16. That's, that's me. I get to 16. But that would be a, a separate conversation for a different person, right? The super achiever, that, that kind of biohacking, always looking for an edge person. But for the average bear, it's like common sense. Stop eating when you feel full. Create a minimum 12-hour fast window. Don't eat things that aren't food. Eat every three to four hours, breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner. Don't graze. Try to avoid eating over 20 grams of added sugar in your food. And drink minimally. Have like no more than six drinks a week. And when you choose alcohol, go with the wine, go with a dark beer or a dark alcohol that doesn't have a bunch of sugar in it. If you adhere to that common sense, you're going to succeed. You're going to be just fine. But it's when we overeat and we eat garbage that things just go completely sideways for us health-wise. And I'm assuming when you refer to garbage, it's ultra processed food, a lot of sugar, the bad yep. sweeteners. Yes, fake foods, fake sugars, fake sweeteners, fake or I'm sorry, fake sugars, fake colors, fake flavors, fake fats. All of that is not food. I would cut that out whenever and wherever possible. I don't even practice the, you know, there's room for this in a healthy diet. I I don't agree. Um, of course, we can't always avoid it, 
but there's just no room in your diet for red number 40. That's not food, right? It's, it's, it is not food. So it's a chemical, shouldn't be there. Now, if we're talking about sugar, then I would go to the 80-20 rule for most people of like, okay, have the brownie, have the cupcake, make it 20% of your daily calorie allowance. And for people to say they don't count calories, that's a lie. It's a lie to sell you something because it's so goddamn easy to do, period. And if you look at all of these trends, when it comes to weight management, all they're doing is forcing some form of calorie restriction. What do you think Ozempic does? What's the mechanism? Appetite regulation. Oh my God, magic. What happened? They ate less. That's why they lost weight. When you look at intermittent fasting, not for longevity, but weight loss. Well, why? Because you've cut out the late night snack and you cut out breakfast. That's why. That's why you're losing weight. You're cutting calories. It's common sense. So you mentioned Ozempic. So of course we have to go there. I uh, know. I'm sorry. <laughs> to do it to you. Um, look, if you go to the website, I encourage people to do this because I'm trying to avoid a lawsuit. So I'll be, I'll be I, <laughs> another lawsuit. I will be as uh, vague as I as I can be here to to maintain some level of protection. Go to the website and look at the side effects. So you've got the common side effects that will include everything from heart palpitations, nausea, and vomiting, right? To the to the more significant side effects that involve your pancreas, your kidney, kidneys, your thyroid. <laughs> Suddenly we have one kidney from Ozempic. I, and I, now I'm being sued. Your kidneys, your pancreas, your thyroid, and the list goes on. So there are some very significant side effects. And I'll say it's my opinion that those side effects are significant um, in relation to taking that drug. In addition, if you look at the research that's been put out about how much weight you lose, and I haven't refreshed myself before this interview, but I believe at the absolute most, over the course of 17 months, their greatest success is 15% of your body weight. And you're thinking, well, that's a hell of a lot of weight, Jill. Okay, let's, let's do the math, right? So if you're a woman that's 180 pounds, 15% is gonna be, what is that, 18 plus nine, like 27 pounds? I could take that same woman and take 27 pounds off of her in six months, not 17, with zero side effects, and that's conservative. Six months, I mean, that is a conservative number for 27 pounds. So, all right, I can do that with diet and exercise more efficiently and far more safely, right? With no dangerous side effects. But if we go a step farther, let's look at what happens when this is said and done. Because I believe it's, as I said, it's 17 months for the course of treatment, and then you, you have to come off of it. So what happens after? Within the first year, I'm trying, now this you'd have to, I had had this number exact before I had spoken about it previ in previous interviews, but a large percentage of the weight comes back on within the first year. Now, why is it coming back on? Because the drug regulating your appetite is no longer regulating your appetite. So you're gradually overeating and you're gradually putting this weight back on. Give it two years, guarantee you it'll all be back on and arguably then some. So you haven't dealt with how you're eating. You haven't dealt with the emotional reasons you may be overeating, if in fact that is why you're taking it, because you have a problem with utilizing food as a defense mechanism or a coping mechanism, or you have a food addiction of some sort. Nothing's being resolved there. It's just this kind of clockwork orange way of making food repulsive to you for, I swear to God, making you physically sick when you look at food for 60 something weeks which again, sounds great, except it wrecks havoc on your health, in my opinion, and it isn't lasting and you've learned nothing. And I believe that that's putting it mildly. If we were to address type two diabetes in particular, and not just utilizing the drug as a weight loss tool, I would say the same things to you. And in fact, the individuals that I have personally helped get off of it are type two diabetics. Type two diabetes is reversible. I've been very successful doing this very quickly with a diet change and exercise, 
period. And in fact, this is a protocol that I just put my friend's 70 year old father on and he was on Jardians for type two diabetes, metformin for type two diabetes, and they added Ozempic. And Ozempic did the trick. He was so sick from Ozempic that he was willing to do anything to get off of these drugs. And by the way, he was on like 10 other medications and he's not overweight, he's just unhealthy, which goes to the bigger picture of you can be unhealthy at any size. That said, I simply had him walk. I built him up to 10,000 steps a day over the course of a month. I started him at five, built him up to 10 because he had injuries. He couldn't lift weights or I would have had him training big muscle groups. I started him at a pretty significant fast window. I started him at a 16 hour fast window, but I let him dirty fast it with MCT oil from hours 12 to 16. So he got to do a teaspoon of MCT oil in his coffee in the morning to kind of help stabilize him hunger wise. I removed added sugar. I removed processed flour. Um, I limited it to three meals a day. I forced him to kind of eat. And I say forced because it was the foods I basically wrote out the diet, but I took all of the high GI foods out of there. I just all gone and essentially put him on a plant-based form of keto for 30 days. And yes, I hate keto, but for type two diabetics, in a limited time frame with high quality food that's plant based, I think it serves an excellent purpose. It's as a diet forever with high quantities of garbage meat, I think is a terrible thing. And within 30 days, he was off of every diabetes medication. And in fact, he just sent me his this is we're now about we started this in November. And he sends me his numbers every day. Here they are, right here. Every day he sends them to me. So 7 a.m., two hours, after, two hours after his first meal, sugar, 130. Oxygen, 97. Blood pressure, 121 over 78. Pulse, 64. 9 p.m., sugar, 110, two hours after meal. Like I get all the numbers, all the medication, gone. So he's not the first, and hopefully he won't be the last. So I also don't agree with these drugs for type 2 diabetics. I think that if you need it strategically, as you're transitioning with healthier nutrition and fitness and healthier lifestyle practices overall, that it's an essential tool to get people on the right track. But I don't think that these drugs should be legacy drugs for anyone. And type two diabetes should be treated, in my opinion, with lifestyle. I think that's how you'll get the best results for the longest amount of time. 100% agreed. And so, you know, I, I've been doing this for 14 years. And I think about when we first launched My Body Green in 09, we've just come so far in terms of technology, the wearables, the testing, information. Uh, people are a lot more educated, access in terms of food. Um, there are just so many great options, restaurants. Like we, we've come so far, yet we're getting sicker. Obesity is at an all-time high. And so I, I've asked this question to, to a number of guests. What, what, are we, what are we doing so wrong? I'm curious, your take. Everything. I, I mean, we're, we're hitting, it, it's on a myriad of fronts. You know, if you listen to, I, are you familiar with Dr. Casey Means? Yes. She's we've a, had her on the show. We've, I, oh, I, we've I, had I, her? I, I've had her. I've tested out levels. I've, I've worn the CGM. Yeah, she's a genius, right? This, this woman is brilliant. And I, I would encourage... You know, when I, when I speak, by the way, with, with uh, some air of expertise, it's because the information that I am you know, disseminating and attempting to then put, put forward into the world comes from medical professionals that I deeply respect and trust and admire. She happens to be one of, I'd say, 20 doctors that I just think are exceptional in, in every way. And if you listen to her talk about how these doctors are being trained, I mean, that's a huge part of the problem. Like she'll tell you that uh, what's considered a success in medicine is how long you've kept the patient on their medication, that they don't even check to see if you're a hyper insulinemic until you're pre-diabetic, which means that for a decade, you've been struggling with this and they didn't even check, they don't even care, doesn't even matter. When you get to pre-diabetic, you're pretty far down the road 
it seems like, oh, I'm just beginning this problem. Oh no, this has been a serious problem for a decade that they should have caught and should have intervened with, but doctors aren't trained that way. You know, I'll, I'll talk to a gastroenterologist that I'm obsessed with named Dr. Robin Chutkan, and she's written multiple bestsellers on gut health, right? We know Robin, we've had her, yeah. Oh my God, she's I, I, I like a guru. And, and she will literally tell you, Oh no, to, to proton pump inhibitors as a legacy drug is devastating and it's going to do this and all these NSAIDs are going to do that. But most doctors are not trained that way. It's like that, that, um, that TED talk about being an upstreamist, right? Where, where, you know, these doctors run in and perform triage and they treat symptoms, but so many are not taught to look upstream and solve problems. I think that's a huge issue, huge. And I think in addition, culturally, we've made not just obesity, but because obesity it, unto itself is not the problem. Obesity is an indicator that if you've stored all of this excess energy, you've been eating more food than your body is burning. And what that generally means is A, B, C, D, and E for your health. And then what does fat do in the body? It disrupts your endocrine system. It holds your vitamin D. I mean, we could go on and on and on. And Rhonda Patrick is excellent at explaining how dangerous that is. Or Dr. William Lee just wrote a whole book about how dangerous that is and what all of this excess body fat does in the body and you know what your body goes through in order to get it there. So we should be having these conversations in a very neutral way where we can educate people like, hey, look, there's health ramifications to this. And we want you, you know, to just know it and have the tools because you love your body, not because you hate it, because you are valuable and we want you around longer. But these conversations have become third rail in America. And arguably, when people are brave enough to have them, you know, you've you've got a conversation where it's like, oh, you're just you're healthy at any size, which is an absolute lie. Show, show me the references on those studies. <laughs> like what, what are the biomarkers that you're looking at? Like, are you really, are you looking at plaques in the brain? Are you looking at the blood brain barrier? Are you looking at the gut micro bio? Are you looking at the microflora of their gut? Like, what are you looking at? Cause they're not on diabetes medication and they haven't had a full blown heart attack. You claim that they're healthy. So I think people are afraid to speak honestly and people who are unhealthy and obese have been marginalized for such a long time that their defense mechanisms are up. How do you include people in a conversation in a way that makes them feel valued, right? Not less valuable in a way that empowers them. And that's an empathy versus sympathy conversation. Right? Because empathy is, yeah, I get it, but you can do it. And I know you know it. So let's find a way forward. Stop selling yourself short. Sympathy is, you poor, sad, sorry little thing, just take the stairs or it's not your fault, it's genetic. That's all bullshit. We know it's all bullshit. Genetics, people have only been obese for the past hundred years. Did we have a quantum leap in genetics that I didn't know about? It's not true. Yep. And, and look, the, I'll just touch on the genetics. So, you know, my passion for health and wellness right now, I'm 48. I have two little girls. My father died of heart disease at 47. My paternal grandfather died of heart disease. Uh, at, excuse me, paternal grandfather cancer at 44 and the maternal grandfather heart disease at 49. So men have a very poor track record longevity in my family. But to your point, I'm not buying it. I believe in epigenetics. Your genes are not your destiny through life through lifestyle and when appropriate pharmaceutical interventions, you can you can change you can change your genes. I've done that. If you need statins, like okay, if if you cuz cuz there's something to be said about that. Like you are missing an enzyme that removes LDL. Okay, that's you 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 will need medication for that. Thank God we have that. But in reality, when it comes to obesity, Oh, well, if you're one parent's overweight, your propensity is this. And if two parents are overweight, you know, the statistics say 80%. Yeah, because look at the environment. You know, I want to touch on mindset. 
you know, it's my mindset. And, and look, there have been times when I was turning 48 in November, I, I wrote something. I was really struggling with it. It was like, wow, like I feel like I'm like, yeah, but like I was fine. Everything else is fine. I've got great doctors, all my blood work, all my cardiology. I'm great. But still mentally it was a bit of a hurdle. And I know mindset is everything. And something you said I want to touch on, you know, when we're talking about do we have a victim mentality or do we have the the right mindset? Do we believe we can overcome something? Do we, I think about, you mentioned body positivity, intuitive eating, I think well-intentioned, but nuanced. And I think all of these things play a role. Yes. I, I mean, if we looked at body positivity, again, this is where I would shift and say, you should absolutely love your body. And from that place, you should want it to be as healthy and strong as possible because it is the one home that you will have in this entire lifetime, right? So it, if you truly do love yourself and want the best for yourself, if you put health in front of anything, you're going to get the word better, right? A better quality of life overall, better immunity, better sleep, better sex, better confidence, like you name it. With health in your life, you can guarantee that the word better will go in front of whatever it is you seek. That said, um, I mean, intuitive eating, sure. In theory, yes, stop eating when you're full. But when you're looking at somebody that is uh, obese or morbidly obese, and I'm talking about 100 pounds plus of excess body fat, okay? This is not a person who loves Twinkies. This is not a person that's lazy. This is not a person that's genetically fucked. That's not true. This is an individual that for one reason or another is choosing to overeat or choosing to be a bigger size or choosing both. And they likely don't realize it because it's unconscious. But I promise you that at one point or another, the food in that function was their psychological survival. So to say something as absurd as stop eating when you're full, there's something much deeper going on there. Like you, you can't, they know they're full. That is not why they're turning to the food. And I know because I've worked with so many people who struggle with food in that capacity. If it was as simple as, okay, you know, just stop with the diet culture, diet culture is evil. And like it isn't even about diet culture. You can you can assign it to diet culture. You can project, you know, oh, diet culture made me feel inferior. Well, it doesn't make me feel inferior. I don't give a shit about it at all. Why? Because it's not triggering something more primal in me. So, you know, when you get into things like that, it's it makes sense for the right individual that is not utilizing food for an emotional reason that they may or may not understand and in most cases don't. So if here we are in 2023 with a giant problem, as I think about, you know, I'll, I'll put what's contributing to this problem, I'll, I'll put them in buckets. You know, there, there's cultural issues, there's, we'll call it trauma, mindset, there's education, access. Like, how do you think about all of these things in, in trying to provide a, a best guess of why we're here? <sighs> Uh, providing a best guess, I mean, you also, it depends on the person we're talking about. So if we're talking about the dad bod guy, it's. Sure. Let's go to the dad bod guy. The dad bod guy is like, you know, he's got a desk job. He's got two kids. Life got hard. He became the white knight to everybody but himself. That's the dad bod guy. That's not the guy that's using food as a, as a defense mechanism, right? This guy is just, it's like, He's probably turning to food as a reward at the end of the day. It's cheap. It's easy. It's accessible. Um, you know, his lifestyle hasn't hasn't given him a real opportunity to take a ton of me time. And it, it could be socioeconomic. It could be environmental. It could be, you know, doctors haven't educated him. And this guy, honestly, just needs to get fed up one day. Uh, really. And so does that woman. The same mom. Like, just needs to get a little fed up. And have some sort of epiphany where they go, ah, eh, you know what? Fuck it. I had a scary 
check up with my doctor. I do not like where these numbers are going. I'm in my 40s. I'm ready to make a change, right? They, they just need a little something that scares them. And that's that kind of biggest loser rock bottom moment. I would hope it's something inspirational. I really would. Because I, I love to tell people lead by example and you know create something inspirational and aspirational that flips that switch for them. But really, in most cases, it's you know Bill Clinton having a quadruple bypass and changing his life. It's that. It, re it really is. Which, like I said, I, I would like it to be the latter of inspiration and aspiration, but usually it's something real damn scary. And in the words of J.K. Rowling, like rock bottom is a great place to, great foundation to rebuild your life. So hopefully we get a little shift where they think, all right, enough of this. And they want to make some changes. And this is where to that individual, I'm like, hey, dude, it's common sense. And we go back to our conversation of how I would have, what diet I would recommend to them to begin with, right? The 80-20 rule, the common sense rule, the minimum 12-hour fast rule, the don't eat shit that isn't food rule and move your body as often as you can, they will be fine. Um, I just think life, modern day life kind of catches up to them. When it comes to the person that is 100 plus pounds overweight, that is absolutely a, a story um, that is historical for them, and it is a much deeper issue to solve slash resolve. Um, and I think that the more that is not like diet culture and it's not processed foods and it's not socioeconomics, it is, it is purely emotional and it's a, it's a more difficult beast. So as you think about, you said, you know, move your body, let's talk about exercise. Cause I think we've got, we've got a movement problem as well. Yeah, we do. I know. Um, what I would say again, if I was. I mean, you and I could have probably hours of conversation about like hit workouts and how much intensity and how much steady state and what, how many, st what does the research say and how much stress is too much stress and what are the most effective workouts for mitochondrial biogenesis? Like, I'm sure we could geek out like crazy, the two of us. Like, I read this and I, we did at the gym. You know, we were, you're like, well, I do this. I was like, what do you think about that? You know, we, we could do that probably you and I for hours sifting through shit we read and a doctor we spoke to and a study we saw and a workout we tried, but I could come up with an answer that I think is going to be scientifically superior with regard to utilizing fitness as it means for longevity and athleticism and a healthy body weight. But if the person looked me in the eye and said, I would rather stick needles in my eyeballs than show up for this right? It's not going to work. It's, it's just not. What's the number one rule of fitness is consistency. I, I got to look at that above all else. Before we talk about all the science behind muscle splits and peripheral heart action and metabolic conditioning and HIIT training, apply all that shit and mobility and blah, 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 blah. like they got to show up. So what I would love is if we could get people a stand up desk. I literally will go work at the kitchen counter. I stand at my kitchen counter and I, you know, I have like my red light set up that I get my, <laughs> but I, that I also get my red light therapy at the same time. And I'll play music because it, it makes me want to stand and kind of move a little bit while I'm working. Um, you can get a little treadmill walking thing with your stand up desk. Like I would start there with a step minimum. Literally, I would start people with a 5,000 step a day minimum working up to 10. If we can get them there, I would love to get them doing strength training. Oh my God, a minimum of three times a week. And I would create muscle splits. It's like push split, pull split, total body split. If I could get four times a week for 30 minutes, oh my God, I'd be living so large. We would do push on Monday, Thursday, pull on Tuesday, Friday. And then if I could start to get like, oh, make it a circuit and get the hit intervals in there, sure. But right now, like stand up, don't sit get your steps in and we can create literally accomplish miracles just with that. Just with that is how I got my friend's dad off of all those medications within four weeks, pretty much. So you mentioned a lot, you mentioned push pull, you mentioned a lot just there in, ter in terms of exercise. I, you know, if we were to like go, go to the basics, is it as simple for someone who can't go to the gym, you know, doing some air squats, doing some push-ups, doing some sit-ups? Like, how do, how do you think about like, okay, I've got nothing. What, 
I got 10 minutes. I'm a working mom. I got 10 minutes. Yeah. What like can I nothing do? Nothing is you, you have the best tool inherently, which is your own body weight. Now, you know, when I, it's, I work with, you know, but I hurt my back. I work with, with um, this gentleman named Dr. Stuart McGill, who's a PhD. And I, I believe one of the foremost spine experts on the planet. And he'll tell you, even with the most basic things, he had to write an entire book about back pain because not only does everybody have different pain triggers, but you could tell somebody get down to the ground in this way to maintain a neutral spine and Half the people can't do it. Half the people have had a knee replacement. Half the people don't have the lower body straight. And the list goes on. So while I'm going to say your body is the best tool, walking is free. It's accessible. Everybody can do it. Now, if I say air squats, but they don't have the mobility to do them, right? I'd be like, okay, let's go to the wall. We're going to do wall sets. Or, you know, is there, I just started working with this company that um, the DV method has an assisted squat machine for people just like that that can't do it, right? Because you can't believe how many can't perform a proper body weight squat or a proper lunge and can end up doing more harm than good. It's not to intimidate you. I would just say, do a little bit of homework because you can do things like modified planks, supermans. You could get a couple of bands and do all your, you know, your rows by hooking the band around the leg of a, your couch, right? You could do modified push-ups. All of these things can be modified, a wall sit. You can work your way up utilizing your own body weight. And if there's 10 minutes a week, or I'm sorry, 10 minutes a session, uh, train the big muscle groups, do your homework on form. But that's why I like, if you're an absolute beginner, I default to walking because we can get them to a healthy body weight. We can condition their cardiovascular system. We can make them less intimidated. And then we can start to bring them into the things that are a bit more aggressive. Uh, but educate yourself on form before you just start jumping into these things. That's all. And there's so many resources out there to teach people this stuff. So as you mentioned, we did in fact meet at the gym, very on brand for Jillian Michaels. She was at the gym working very hard. Um, and you know, something I appreciate and this will sound superficial, but uh, at the gym we go to, I work with a trainer there sometimes and all the trainers look the part. And, uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. I feel like I can learn something from from some of these trainers. And I have. And it's been incredible. And, and I'm curious for me, again, it will sound superficial. When, when, when I've always looked at trainers or just my philosophy in general is you, you want to learn from someone, if you can, who looks the part, specifically when you're talking about a trainer. I'm curious, your point of view there, if someone has the resources and the time, to look for a personal trainer at their gym, what do they look for? Credentials. <laughs> Credentials, man. Um, because, see, you see someone that looks the part, but then I see somebody that, that has his client doing a backloaded squat with a butt wink and I want to blow my braids out. <laughs> like, oh my God. Or like a, you know, a Bulgarian split squat, completely bent over at the waist. And it's just like, I want to, die when I see it. Um, you know, I see people doing the stupidest shit that they shouldn't be doing and like standing on a BOSU ball when they've got 50 pounds of weight to lose. And, you know, I just, I see, I see a horror show, not at our gym, but often, you know, a lot of the time. And my wife looks at me and she's like, Oh my God, babe, stop. Cause she can see my head. You know, I'm just like, what in the fuck is that person doing? Um, so look, I, I would say, you know, but the same goes for doctors, right? And we were just talking about that. And lawyers, like not every, not every person in the same profession puts their pants on the same way. So the first thing is credentials. I think the second part of it is which credentials specifically? Are there specific credentials? I mean, honestly, if I if I could really get people to I would and I don't have one, and this is why I think it's important, I would want you to have somebody with a degree in exercise science. <laughs> Cause I I have seen the difference and it's, it's pretty staggering. Um, or corrective exercise, I think is really important. There's a guy um, that I love out of California, uh, out of Los Angeles named Brandon Bowles. And I actually set him up with Gunnar Peterson over there who, guess what? Gunnar has a degree. Love Gunnar. Um, and so does everyone else. With that said, I've, you know, throughout the years, worked with people like that and, 
I hate to say, and especially after having a back injury, there's really no room for the weekend certification person. There's just not. So I, if the, your person has a degree in exercise science, I'd like to start there. If we could go down the ladder to corrective exercise. Okay. Because a corrective X person is going to understand biomechanics and imbalances in the body and know how to rebuild you in a way so that you're more functional, that you're not reinforcing dysfunctional movement patterns, um, that is not going to injure you because they don't know what they're doing. And I, I, you know, look, when I started out, I had no business being a trainer. I was 17 and I was training for my black belt and it looked cool and, you know, made more money than I was making at the time. And my mom got me a weekend certification and I'm sure I was fucking deadly at that age. You know, I fortunately never hurt anyone, but I'm sure I was like a, a loaded gun, you know, you know, enough to do real damage. And over the years of owning a sports medicine facility and working with the Brandon Voleses and the Stuart McGills and, you know, and working directly under the supervision of physical therapists, I got a, edu I got a significant education, but it took years for me to learn these things. So I would say get a person who's highly credentialed. If they just have like, okay, they're, you know, they're with NASM or ACSM, that's okay. Those are good certifications. How long have they been doing it? Um, you know, ask for referrals. But in addition, I would educate yourself. Same thing like when you go into a doctor's office. Why are you prescribing me Ozempic? Is there any way to reverse this naturally? Like, why am I on this drug? How come? I mean, I, my 10 year old, he was a, a C section baby. No choice. My ex was tiny. He was huge. This was a decade ago. And they put her on antibiotics. Long story short, he's always kind of had a gut issue, this poor kid. And he had chronic ear infections and they were pumping him full of antibiotics at a young age. And he's got gut issues. So I'm trying to get to the bottom of what's triggering these gut issues, right? I'm like, is it milk? Is it gluten? Like, what the fuck is it? And getting a 10 year old to pull things out of their diet is not easy. So he goes to the doctor and the doctor wants to put him on a proton pump inhibitor. And of course I call Dr. Chuck in and I'm like, am I an asshole or is this insane? And she's like, that's insane. Let me refer you to someone else. So those are some pretty heavy credentials. This is a pediatric gastroenterologist at a pretty big hospital in Los Angeles. Being educated yourself when you walk in the room, right, is going to allow you to know if that trainer knows what they're doing. If you know the proper form for a squat and their client isn't doing one, that's not the guy you hire. Watch a 10 minute video on YouTube from somebody you know and trust. And if that trainer's squat doesn't look the way that it should, and their client squat doesn't look the way that it should, that is a person you do not hire, period. So go in at least somewhat empowered so you can ask the right questions. Love that. And so you mentioned your back injury, which was pretty serious. Can you, can you talk about what happened and your recovery? Ah, uh, man, I would love to tell you some like really cool story. I was racing motorcycles with Valentino Rossi and then, you know, oh, I was surfing the big waves in Hawaii with Kelly Slater, but no, I was uh, running into a bathroom to tell my then fiance that Ethereum had crossed 3000 because we had thought it was hilarious. This was like the age of Dogecoin. Remember when like Elon Musk was on SNL and crypto was on fire and we just thought it was the funniest thing and we would day trade all that crap for fun, not a ton of money. We just thought it was fun. So Ethereum had crossed 3000. I went running into the bathroom to tell her. And I, I, I was like, sell, because I thought it was going to dump. She didn't. Anyway, the bathroom floor was wet and it was like a Garfield cartoon. Like I slipped on a banana peel, except it was water on the floor and went totally horizontal, parallel to the ground and landed with my back on the edge of the bathtub. And I, oh my God, you know, for, you know that moment where you see stars, but you're like, no, I'm good, no, I'm fine. It, it, Ellen DeGeneres had a skit about this where she walks into a glass window 
And they're like, are you okay? But she's kind of so embarrassed that she's like, oh, fine. no, great. She, have you seen my eye? Like, you know, like you fucked yourself up really bad, but you're not fully aware of how bad and you know, you don't want to scare anybody. So that happens. And you know, I get off the floor for days. I'm like, Oh, my back. But if you know, you, it feels how you think it should. Like you got whacked in the back with a baseball bat. Like, ouch, of course I'm going to be sore. Of course I'm going to be bruised. Thank God for my core strength, right? Like, oh, can you imagine how much worse this could have been? So now I'm in the middle of moving across country. And I'm thinking, like, my back is just killing me. But time has passed. And it's not like a bruise. It's it's muscle spasms, crazy muscle spasms. And I'm thinking, like, okay, my psoas is tight. I always have a tight psoas. I've got a slight lateral pelvic tilt. Like that's just out of whack. I, that's what's bothering me. I'm stressed out of my mind with this move is really stressful. And this goes on to the point that it's September and I fell in April and my back is locked up for months. And I'm thinking to myself like, okay, you know, I've got, Thai women walking on me. My son is smashing the crap out of me for 25 cents a minute with a Theragun. I'm like in yoga, stretching my brains out of my body. Not, and of course, making it all worse. And the irony of this, here's the great irony is, I owned a sports medicine facility, like a real one. <laughs> I actually owned, I worked under the supervision of physical therapists. That whole spiel I just gave you, that's a real story for me. So, you know, I haven't done rehab in a long time, but I, I would do segments on YouTube with, with Brandon, my corrective ex guy. Like I know all this shit, but I somehow thought that a back injury, I think in my brain, you, you don't realize that of course you're not severing your spinal cord. It never occurred to me that I could have fractured my spine. So my back was in such a spasm from the injury that my spine had become so significantly out of alignment that as I'm doing all this crazy shit, I end up like, I'm in so much pain and I go into um, child's pose. And as I go into child's pose on my floor, I'm like, fuck, I'm dying, right? I, I'm just, my, I, I can't even see straight. I'm in so much pain. And as I go into child's pose, I feel, I literally feel something pop in my back and I'm like, what? And it's like lava running down the left side of my body and it shifts out of my low back into my glute on the left side down the front of my quadricep into my knee and i i'm like what the fuck i've never felt anything like it i'd never broken a bone and in your mind you're so disoriented from the pain i draw like i'm i'm on the ground i can't move i can't breathe i've never it feels like i got stabbed and i'm like okay hold on it's not my pancreas. It's not my appendix. You start to, you know, what could cause this kind of pain? I couldn't even wrap my head around it. My wife takes me to the emergency room. She has to call a friend to come carry me into the car, put me in a wheelchair, takes me to the emergency room here at Mercy. By the way, don't go to Mercy. That's a separate organization. <laughs> that was a huge mistake. But she, we didn't know because we're new to Miami. I didn't even have a doctor here yet. I just moved in June. So... Um, long story, a very, to make a very long story short, uh, they didn't know what the hell was wrong and they could only order a CT scan and he could see that there was nerve impingement, but then I couldn't even get into an orthopedic surgeon here. So I reached out to Andrew Hecht who runs HSS in New York. He made phone calls on my behalf. And this just makes me feel that much more for the person that can't call Andrew Hecht. Cause I don't know what I would have done. This went on for two weeks before I made that, put that call in for that favor. Um, I get an MRI, they immediately catch the three herniated discs. So it's L3 to L4, L4 to L5, L5 to S1. And I'm like, how? Cause I'm the girl, right? That won't backload the squat with poor hip mobility. I'm like, how, how, how I've got great core strength. I'm, you know, I like, I, every single thing you, you need to do to not get into back pain. I do. I could not figure it out. So he's like, listen, you're, we're not going to operate. And nobody can tell you, by the way, with this injury, how it resolves itself. They just say it will. And I'm like, well, how? Well, it just does. How does the 
shit go back in the disc? No. <laughs> You're like, what do you mean no? How does it get better? Oh, it usually will get better. And I'm not that person. Like, explain to me how this is going to get better so that I can focus on making it better. And there's no answer, which is really bizarre. And when I tell you I have access to the best people, there's no answer, just does, quote unquote. So it's not getting better. And I remember Stu McGill from working at a sports medicine facility, because when I used to, well, worked at one, then opened my own, and then ended up on Biggest Loser and sold it. But all of the physical therapists, he was everybody's guru, this guy. And my friend Brandon loves him. And years ago, I remember having glanced through one of his books and like, okay, awesome. But I, you know, I just followed the instruction of the physical therapist. I was like, oh, he's, you know, he's their educator. I reach out to this guy on his website and I'm like, hey, all right, this is going to seem really strange, but is there any way I could like hire Dr. McGill to fix me? He reaches out to me the same day. I overnight in my MRI and he gets on the Zoom with me and he goes, when did you fracture your spine? And I immediately, I'm like, who the fuck, right? I'm like, who is this quack fracture my spine? And I'm like, um, you know, you're trying to be polite, right? But you're in, you're in so much pain. And I'm like, um, you know, I, I don't have a, a fractured spine. I have a... I have three herniated discs and I'm like, okay, how, okay. This guy's a how in the world. He goes, no, no. I, he's like, I, I, I know that he's like, but you herniated your L3. I'm like, no, I didn't. He's like, yes, you did. And he shares his screen with me. He's like, look right here. And it looks like a, like a black spot on my vertebrae, like a pinky fingernail. And you never think that that's what a fracture would look like either. By the way, you're like expecting this crack and, He's like, yeah, you did. And I was like, oh my God. And in that moment, all of a sudden, I connected every single dot from the moment I smacked into the bathtub to my back falling apart and being in spasm to herniating the discs to being there. So I'm really sorry. That's a very, very long story that you'll have to edit, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, no. So that, that's a journey. So it took months to get to an answer. And then what happened? How did you get better? Because you you seem to be fine now. Jesus. So the first thing um, that you should not do is ignore it. And people are like, no, it's just tight. It's just tight. It's just tight. I'm like, yeah, that's your body generally, generally sending you a warning sign, right? They're like, hey, you might have something discogenic happening here. And the muscles are spasming to try to brace your, your spine and your core. So I would simply say, if you have back pain and it's like, oh, spasms, oh, tight, oh, back pain, get an MRI. I can't understand how, now that I know what I know, we don't do this like we would do, uh, you know, an ultrasound, a mammogram, a blood work. Like you should know what is going on with your spine? All of a sudden, friends who've gone, it's like, oh, there's bone spurs and there's deterioration of the disc and there's this and there's delaminate, blah, 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 blah. Get, if you have any issues with your back, get an MRI so you know what you're dealing with. Because what many people do, and I'm gonna say many because I've seen so many people do it after I went through this, is they go get the Thai massage, they go get the, you know, they go do the Theragun, they get into they do the spinal twists in yoga, and they end up not being able to get off of that massage table. I've watched 10 people do it since it happened to me. And I think it's because I'm now obviously tuned in and paying attention. And I'm like, oh my God, I wish you told me. Oh, I didn't think it was anything until it's something and they can't get off the floor. So if you have back pain, go get it checked off the list. Be very careful. Don't try to self-diagnose. Don't treat it yourself with like spinal twists and crazy massages and devices you saw on Instagram and exercises you saw on YouTube. Because by the way, you could have individuals on YouTube like, okay, I don't, I love this guy. I love him. Um, he's an, yeah, I'm not even gonna say his name because I, I think I have so much respect for the guy, but he's a, he's a fitness influencer on YouTube, very highly credentialed. I have a ton of respect for him. He is giving a ton of advice about what to do with disc issues, and it's terrible, terrible advice. 
And I, I'm just thinking, and now it would be good advice for a specific individual, the specific injury at a specific place in their recovery, but to give things like nerve flosses and, um, oh my God, all of the, a cobra, all of this shit when you, you, and the person who's watching is in so much pain, they'll do anything to get out of pain. It'll make it so much worse than it, it does. I did myself. So don't, don't, don't be watching things on YouTube and trying to self-treat, self-diagnose, guess it yourself. Don't, don't do any of that. Don't go to the chiropractor. And I, like, oh my God, do not. And if you go to a good chiropractor, they will know not to mess with it. Um, but do not, don't do it. Don't try to put yourself in traction. So if you have a disc injury, you have to realize, and you're in acute pain, you basically have an open wound in your spine. That needs to heal. Think about it like a huge gash, but it's it's on your disc. So that that injury needs to heal so you can get out of acute pain. Then you can begin building resilience and getting into physical therapy. So the first thing he has me do is nothing. He's like, I, I, we got to get you out of acute pain. This injury needs to heal. You're going to lay on your stomach. You're going to work to stand and walk down the hallway and lay back down. And I'm like, well, how, okay, how, how many times down the hallway? He's like, how far can you get him? Five steps, collapse back down to the ground. He's like, you're going to try to do that every hour while you're awake. You can ice, you can heat. I'm fine with acupuncture. He's like, I don't understand it because he's not a specialist in it. He's like, but I've never seen it do harm. I'm okay with you doing that. And that took, Jesus, I want to say six months before he would, before I could, and, and I got epidurals, by the way, and it still took, I'm sorry, six weeks in that phase of acute, acute pain. The epidurals allowed me to, to, to stand. I did them once and do more of the walking. And then after six weeks, we started doing like glute bridges and short stop squats and like this really careful, clean movements, modified side planks, and then curl ups. and. Um, I mean like baby steps, big time. Then he, you know, he's like, at a, like month three, he got me into the nerve flosses and he would do it so slight, so slightly and so minimally. And then we'd wait the next day and see if it triggered pain. And so it took months. And the bottom line is first thing is get the information so that you don't make it worse. Second thing is, once you have the information, see the appropriate individual. If you're not in acute pain, you could probably get into physical therapy or get in with a great corrective X person, lose some weight, strengthen your core, eat better, and prevent a disaster from occurring down the road, right? If you do have an acute injury, you need to get out of acute pain by managing it with the appropriate individual in the ways that I mentioned. Um, and then again, once you're you're healed and out of that acute phase, you can begin to learn clean movement patterns and build resilience. But it's it's a process for sure. How do you feel today? God, today I would tell you, I wouldn't even know. If I didn't know what's in my back, I would think there was nothing wrong with me. And I tend to feel a bit like I have like a time bomb in my spine. And if I if I make a mistake, Right, it's like these landmines. Like, I remember I went to Cambodia, and it's like landmines. Don't go hiking over there. You're just like, whoa, that's that's intense. Don't do that. It's kind of like having this this landmine in your spine, where if you're stupid and you make a mistake, you're gonna set it off. So I am highly aware of that. I still do some dumb shit, but not. I don't load my spine. Um, especially when it's inflection or rotation and I have good spine hygiene and I'm very, 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 very careful. So I have no pain. I, I stabilize my spine. I don't do mobile mobility stuff for my back because it's once you're injured in the way that I am, McGill said to me, he goes, listen, yeah, this is February now of 2022. So we're almost a year and I had was in pain again. And I'm like, why? Like, why does this come and go? Why is it like moving around my body? Like when it when does it get better? He's like, it's a process. He's like, you got to think about, you know, your disc is a flat tire. 
and you're driving around on a flat tire. And he's like, and your body is having to adapt to three flat tires in your spine. And it's taking time. Which, Jesus, it took some time. And he goes, but you will be okay. And you, we will get you almost always pain-free and you will be functioning again optimally. He's like, I had point guards that were guarding Shaquille O'Neal back in the day with injuries that make yours look like child play, child's play. He goes, but I want you to understand that you will never have your old back back. And I felt at that moment, like I got hit by a bus. Tears just started streaming down my face. And then you think, okay, you know, what can you do with this lesson? What are you meant to take away from it? What are you meant to do with it? How can you give it a meaning? And I think that meaning is me having a completely different empathy for people with chronic pain, hopefully being able to stop somebody from getting this injury or teaching them how to recognize it early so they don't make it worse or teaching them what to do when they are in acute pain so they don't make it worse while they're waiting to get their proper sort of diagnosis and care. Look for the things that you can control. That's what helped me tremendously, right? Like controlling, doing breath work and cold exposure. And I got into all that stuff because it was all I could control. How, you know, how, I'm going to focus on rebuilding my gut microbes and I'm going to get into breath work and I'm going to get into cold exposure and I, I'm going to do all these things I can control while I feel so out of control. That helped me personally. Giving it a meaning, that helped me personally. Um, reading success stories. Don't look at the, you will find horror stories online. Don't read that shit. Like a success story. That's what you want to read. Focus on that. And know enough. Like I, I strongly recommend that people get McGill's book, The Back Mechanic, because it's going to allow them to recognize their pain triggers, learn how to listen to their body. And when they're speaking to their doctor, know the questions to ask, recognize if that physical therapist is not as good as they maybe could or should be. I've seen that a lot, which is really scary because the stakes are so high. Um, yeah, a bird dog. If you know how to do a bird dog, right? And then you see a trainer do a bird dog the wrong way, run the other way. Run the other way. You can learn it. You can learn it in, or, or a physical therapist in particular, learn it in McGill's book. And if they don't have you flexing your foot in that bird dog, along with a host of other cues, but if that one's a fucking run. So if you know enough, right? If you know enough, you will know how to protect yourself. So it's like, get educated. And if you follow those steps, I think you could save yourself a lot of damage because I definitely made it much, much worse while I was trying to get myself better, which is shocking because it's me. You'd think I would know everything to do and can't. And when you're in that kind of pain, you can't even wrap your head around it. So it's hard to understand. So a big part of my why before starting my buddy green, I had excruciating sciatica from an old college basketball injury, L4, 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 L5, S1. So not as bad as you, but my right leg was like a lightning rod. I couldn't walk and went to a doctor. He said, you need surgery. I, I did court. I did the cortisol shots, nothing, sought a second opinion. That doctor said, you know, maybe some yoga or therapy would help. And so I actually tried out a PT and he had me doing like Cobra all the time. And it was like making it so much worse. And in that process, I was like, I'll try yoga. And then our mutual friend, Tara Stiles, played a significant role in my healing. But, but I started to do some really light yoga and Fast forward, I'm fine. I never got back surgery. But hearing you speak, I remember in the process, the sciatica started to like climb back up because it went to the toes and then it starts to recede. Like when it starts to recede, it's getting like, by the time it got to my butt, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting out of this. But I remember the process hearing you speak for a good six to nine months. There were the, you mentioned the landmines. I would have this feeling like, oh, I can't do that. I would be scared. And it would be a process where I would be fine. And then, oop, oh, it's back. Trigger it. The pain triggers. It was very humbling. Yep. And you got to learn like what triggers it and how to work around it. And so spine mobility triggers mine. I can't do it. And well, and this is now, this was 13 years ago, 14 years ago, but I'm fine. But I still have the, I'm still very aware. I could feel 
and it's that 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 intuition, often before the pain, where I'll I'll feel ah uh-uh, this is going in the wrong way. I need to like take it down a notch. Let's go to my go to my go tos, you know, massage my back and so forth. But it's a process. I get into the icing, the tummy laying, the heating, and chill the fuck out. I do ne- walking and walking. Like McGill would have me walk a certain way, tummy lay, ice, heat, might jump over to the acupuncturist. And other than that, I do nothing for like three days until it's completely calm. Like even, even a tight lower back, I'm like, uh, uh, uh-uh. uh, nope. Everything stops. Yeah. And, and the old, at least for me, you know, in that, in the moments like that, the old me would just be like, screw it. I'm pushing through. I'll go to the gym. The me now says, nope, taking the day off, pause. Yeah. Screw it. I'm going to the gym is like that will end you up in back surgery without a question. And my whole thing with it is, listen, I I would like to get two decades out of this spine. And I'm hoping that in two decades, the surgery will have advanced so tremendously that replacing discs will be like replacing a hip, you know, I, but outside of that, there's really, it's not that trustworthy. I've seen miracles with back surgery and I've seen horror stories and it is the most complicated type of surgery, more complicated than brain surgery. Um, it's just so high risk and you want to avoid it until you absolutely have no choice. And I just say, kick the can as far down the road as you possibly can, as you wait for medicine to kind of advance. I'm sure they'll figure out something where you're not invasive, where you're hanging upside down and you know, maybe with some cold and throwing some peptide injections. And I'm not a believer in those injections in the spine, only, even though like I've heard some people swear by it, but all the experts that I talk to say no way. I've never seen anything good come out of injecting anything into the spine. And Hecht said that to me, who's like the guy in New York. Cause I was like, well, I'll just do stem cells. And he was like, no, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> not in the spine in like a shoulder, maybe, you know, but not in the spine. I, I Anthony Robbins, I, I interviewed him. He had a shoulder issue though. Uh, uh, oh, I think it was cervical spine. Wasn't it? I think he had a cervical spine issue, but he did some crazy shit where he like left the country and I don't even, I, it's in his most recent book, but the book is about a thousand pages. So I keep telling myself I'm going to read it and I haven't gotten there yet. We'll, we'll offline about this, but I may have someone for you. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So lots going on in the world. W- what concerns you and what excites you? What concerns me um, culturally? I would say is the lack of tolerance that we're seeing across the board is the extreme polarization uh, on the right and the left. While I think most people sit somewhere in the middle, you definitely have the tail wagging the dog and drowning out common sense. Um, That's really scary for sure. And, you know, I was listening to Bill Maher, Love Bill Maher. Uh, right? I mean, give one of his monologues about how the extreme left is becoming so woke, he likened it to Maoism. And at first I was like, all right, come on. But as I listened and he's like, and it started out with this and then putting people in dunce caps. And then I was like, holy shit, this is exactly what's happening. And it's, that really scares me because when you start, silencing the truth and the facts for the sake of the narrative like that's you know democracy is very fragile as we all know and it's, it it looks it's a real scary time here it reminds me of what the 50s must have been like in the mccarthy trials you know it's like salem witch kind of shit like god forbid and no one's allowed to make a mistake yeah well, I just, uh, yeah, I don't know how, how we advance as a society when everyone's afraid of a conversation. Well, you know, on that point of extremism, 
you know, my, my wife and I actually, I'll have to send you, we wrote a book, it's coming out in May, The Joy of Wellbeing. I think you'll like it. Uh, but one of the things we, we talk about in the book, it, it, building off of your point, is the algorithm favors engagement. Engagement, what drives engagement is extremism. Uh, Scott Galloway, who we've had on the show, who's been on Bill Maher, in, in his book, referenced this fascinating study out of Wharton and Penn, where they, they looked at the New York Times most emailed list, essentially all the articles that go viral, and they classified them, uh, anxiety, awe, and anger. And guess what indicated, what, what led virality, essentially what increased vi vir virality was anger. So if you elicited anger, the article was more likely to go viral. And if you think about politics, you think about health and wellness, you know, if you look at what goes viral on your Instagram feed, it's having an extreme point of view, which makes someone angry or speaks to an ideology. And that's what the algorithm favors. You know, it's, it's comment and that's engagement. And that's unfortunately the world we live in with media. It's scary. I, I, was, um, I was talking to Tim Urban the other day and as you just wrote that book called What's Wrong With Us, and it, it's kind of like uh, looking at society. And I was like, here's what's crazy is that the people I see doing this in some cases are some of the most educated individuals that I know. Freaks me out that we could be so aggressive and extreme and call for blood and ruin people's lives. And I, that's just not my generation. You know, my, my, and everybody thinks their generation's better, but. I remember when like, we didn't want any labels. It was like, hey, love is love. One race, the human race. And we were all so proud of that because we had a sticker. <laughs> it was like race, human, yay. And you actually thought things were gonna get better and everybody was gonna kind of accept and live and let live and move forward. And now it's like, Jesus, there's a million labels for everything. And it's just, it freaks me out. It does, and, and not having the, patience for somebody whose opinion is different than yours. I can't wrap my, how are you supposed to, how, how are they supposed to learn and grow? And how are you supposed to learn and grow if you can't tolerate a different opinion without calling for that person's head? I want their career. I want their livelihood. I want them fired. I want them dead and gone. It's like, wow, the hell is that shit? Jesus. Scary. It is scary. And I, I do think most people are sane. They're just afraid to kind of jump in. I agree, which is even scarier though. And you know, I must admit that I don't see many women doing it. I see men doing it. Um, you know, you've got your, your handful of guys out there that everybody knows of, and whether you agree with them or not, they are questioning the narrative, right? So it's, going to be, and I don't mean the far right, the far right will always question the narrative because they don't actually cancel on the right from what I can tell. Now, I, I could be very wrong, but you know, you got Marr, you've got Chappelle, you've got Rogan, you've got Jordan Peterson, you've got, you know, like a, Elon Musk, a handful of guys that I would argue were probably center left, some far left, that are the ones kind of brave enough. And then all the people that they have on their show, whether it's Gad Sad, um, all, of, all of the experts that they have on their show across different categories of science, health, wellness, um, to kind of question the narrative. But there's no women saying anything. I can't think of one, except the far right. But like I said, they, that they're still locked into their opinion. They're not questioning people from different points of view. It freaks me out, man. I don't like it. <laughs> I think it's also true in health and wellness. I Very think much There so. are many people who have their own shows, will not have someone on who's got a different point of view, whether they're a paleo or vegan or whatever Very it might be, or so. Pilates versus I've seen that. Like They don't talk to them. I've had people on pretty much from every 
Now, I don't go at them on the show because I don't think that's fair. So, you, you know, I will listen to them and let them talk and share their entire point of view. And like, I can't tell you how many come on and say calories. It's not true. Yes, it is true. But okay. You know, I will, I will, I will, or I like to, I just let them share their point of view. I don't make it combative. Uh, Cause my audience knows what I think about it already. So I want to hear kind of what, what they think about it. I've had, I don't get too political because I'm I'm an expert in my area, right? Like I'm not trying to teach you what to think about anything outside of where I am an expert. I have opinions, but I'm not an expert, and I'm you know, I'm certainly not here to try to influence someone's opinion about anything outside of health and wellness. If in fact they're trying to make a better better life for themselves, but I know I find it it's fucking crazy. It scares me to death. Like we don't do politics either here. Uh, in, in the context we talked about it, but it was in the context of you shouldn't try to cancel people and you shouldn't try to hate people. And, and if you, you hate someone, just try to understand what what specifically it is. But the narrative of health and wellness now is we're starting to deny science. Yeah, and that's really scary. Like I was I was listening to Rhonda Patrick and Joe Rogan. I don't know how old this was, um, but they were talking about some article that talked about the health benefits of obesity. And he was running down the list and she's like, this is, and she was on rep. <laughs> and she's a pretty calm, reasonable, a highly intelligent individual. I, I follow her all the time on Found My Fitness and listen to her lectures and read her blogs. And she's like, this is a complete lie. And, and, and then outlines all the reasons it's a lie. And she's like, where are the references for this? Show me the data for this. And there is none, but it sounds good, right? It's, people want to hear it. Oh yeah, fat shamer. You're like, fat shamer. Wow. Like you could have 10 years, if you read an article about me in the New York Times 10 years ago, it would tell you that I was a hero to, to people who were overweight because I had empathy for it and I understood it. And, and, and I was except I could literally read you the article. And then I could read you an article from the New York Times now calling me a fat shamer. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's what drives clicks. That's what drives revenue. And their business model, the, the, you know, the more media companies move to a subscription business model, unfortunately, the more you have to play to your base and give the base what they want to hear. You don't want to challenge their point of view because they may unsubscribe. Different when it's an advertiser. Advertiser, you it's a whole other, you get the whole other set of parameters, but the reality is the New York Times is focusing on subscription. Yeah, you're right. There was this great data point someone shared. Uh, Donald Trump was the best thing for the New York Times. Subscriptions went through the roof. They would write every day how much they hated Donald Trump, and a lot of people felt the felt the same way. Well, specifically their their readers, and it was good for it was good for business. I read the same thing about CNN. I heard the same thing that he was great for business. Yes. So, okay, that's enough about what concerns us. There's lots that concern us. What what excites you? What's exciting to you in 23? A lot excites me. You know, there's a lot that's scary in the world, but a lot excites me. There's a lot of younger people that I actually do see a ton of promise in. Um, and that's exciting. I, I think that there's a creativity that the younger generation always brings to the table, a fresh perspective. And when you add that to knowledge that's proven, right? You, you get real progress. I think that's where magic happens is they, they can take what we know works and reinvent it so that it goes to the next level. I, I look at myself now, for example, when I was younger, I used to be all about me, Jillian, Jillian's career, Jillian's goals. Then of course you get older and you have kids and all of a sudden you start to realize you're just a stepping stone to something greater. You know, you're, you're just this wrong on the ladder and you're proud to be where you are, but it's exciting to see people putting in the wrongs above you and what they're doing and what they're creating. And you want to help continue to elevate fresh new perspectives um, and voices, uh, whether it's fitness or for me, it's always the better for you category, right? Whether it's food or fitness or some aspect of wellness. I find that really exciting professionally. Um, personally, 
I, I I like this stage of my life. My kids can wipe their own ass. They can make their own breakfast. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of freedom in that. Like you're you're kind of you're able to go out to dinner or a weekend away without feeling guilty, like you did when they were three. You know what I mean? Like my daughter's on the phone with her friends 24 seven. She still asks me where I'm going when I leave the house on a date night, but I don't feel guilty. I'm like, what are you, how dare you? You're on the phone all the time. Go go back in your room and talk on the phone. Don't ask me where I'm going for dinner. Uh, but it's, it's nice to kind of have this next phase of my life where it's like, I'm newly married. I love my wife. We have a great relationship. I have a good relationship with my co-parent, my ex. Um, the kids are in a good place. Career-wise, I've, I've been accomplished, obviously, half of what I wished I had, but I've done a good job, and I feel like now it's all downhill from here. Not downhill in a bad way, but downhill in like I don't have to fight tooth and nail and claw my way to get where I'm trying to go. It's an easier trajectory to continue to build and grow. So it's a downhill not an uphill battle. It's a downhill battle, hopefully on an uphill trajectory. <laughs> so, so on that note, what are you working on? right now? Gosh, we're continuing to um, grow and expand uh, the fitness app, which is a fitness platform that customizes your workouts, customizes your meal plans, has some sleep support, some meditation community, adding new talent. We're um, I'm working on a project with uh, Tara Styles actually to come this year. So always adding uh, new talent, but not random talent, in particular experts. That's always been my, kind of like our conversation. To me, I want the best of the best. I think she is creme de la creme in the yoga world. So it's adding people like her um, in categories of wellness that I am not an expert in. So it's building this coterie of go-to experts you can trust. So we're continuing to grow and expand that. Um, we just partnered with a company called iTouch to create a smartwatch that is a hundred bucks and pairs with Android and your iPhone has, gives you all the metrics, works amazing at a fraction, a fraction of the price. Um, I just started working with this company, DB Method, which is a great tool for beginners or people with injuries. Uh, I have a clothing line coming out this fall for, of course, athleisure apparel. Um, I know I'm forgetting a partner and it's driving me crazy. We're in the process potentially of helping to exit a supplement company we invested in back in 2018. So I think we're, we're going to stay on board. So really it's more of selling a percentage of the company um, and helping continue to grow it to the next level if, if it goes. So we'll see, but um, I'm hopeful about it. Cause I really, I love that company. I believe in it. Uh, okay. We got eye touch this one, that one, this one, who am I missing? Uh, uh, I'm going to get in so much trouble if I miss like a new, <laughs> you can already hear like, how come she didn't mention and she forgot. Uh, so that, that's all stuff that we're continuing to work on and grow. And then we've strategically invested in other companies as well, like Thrive Market many years ago, for example, that we're continuing to, to kind of stay on top of and look for opportunities like that one where we think, and I say we, cause you know, myself, my business partner, my company, where we think we can have an impact, you know, might be able to bring something to the table, whether it's capital or you know, a halo effect in the media to grow that brand and that business. So, sure. Yeah. Love Thrive. Um, so last question, let's say you've got your own billboard in LA. What's on your billboard? What's, what's your message on that billboard? Oh gosh, I need to really think about this. I feel like it would be, you know, what's up. That's, I swear to God, like, do I really need to say it? I know you know what's up. Like, I know you know common sense. I know you know what's bullshit and what isn't. I, I like, you know what's up. Follow your gut. Don't, don't follow the narrative. Don't follow the trends. Follow your gut opinion. And if, you know, what is your gut telling you? Follow, follow your heart. You know what's real and what isn't. If you trust that, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to work out just fine. Amen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Jillian, thank you so much. Oh my God, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And you got to come on my podcast when your book is out. 
Would love that. Absolutely love that. Thank you. Pleasure. And I better see you at the gym. Yes. <laughs>